please be seated. The second case for oral argument this morning is the Sierra Club Appellant versus the Clay County Board of Adjustment and Travis Mockler Appellees. For the appellant, we have Mr. Mitchell Peterson, an attorney from Sioux Falls. And for the appellee Mocklers, we have Mr. Brad Donahoe, an attorney from Sioux Falls. And for Clay County, we have Mr. James Simcoe, an attorney from Sioux Falls. I understand, Mr. Donahoe, you'll be speaking first for 15 minutes, is that correct? That's correct. And then, Mr. Simcoe, you would have the remaining five minutes? That's correct. Very well. With that, Mr. Peterson, you may proceed, sir, and you have 20 minutes. May it please the court and counsel. Fundamentally, this case is about the right to be heard. It's about an organization's ability to speak for its members and advocate for its core mission. It's about the access of members, citizens of this state, of this county, uh, to have access to court and have due process, have fairness in the courts. It's about the right to be heard. That's what the issue is before this court. My name is Mitch Peterson. It's my pleasure to represent Sierra Club in this case. Uh, Sierra Club is an organization, a uh, nonprofit, uh, over 100 years old. Uh, it has 700,000 members, over 1,000 in South Dakota, 194 members here in Clay County. Do you uh, have members in pretty much every county in the state? I don't. Um, it's not in the petition, but I also don't know the answer if it's literally every county in the state. I would suspect it's a majority, but probably not all. Okay. So what you're arguing as far as Clay County would not be unique, it would apply to any county where you have a member in South Dakota? Certainly, yes. Uh, anywhere there's, there's members um, where there's an issue in court that's germane to the core mission. So of let's say you had five members in Roberts County. Uh, if you prevail here, those members would be entitled to have Sierra Club uh, in Roberts County do the same type of litigation we're doing here in Clay County? Correct, Your Honor. If, if uh, in Brown County there's a similar environmental issue, Sierra Club would have the ability to represent its members uh, and uh, pursue that relief on their behalf. Conversely, if you went to Union County and you had no members, uh, there wouldn't be standing. They would need to have a member who's aggrieved uh, in some way in order to meet the standing requirements. Uh, so as long as there's a member that is uh, aggrieved, um, then I one believe... One member would be enough. It, it, as long as there's one member that's aggrieved. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and, and ultimately, what we're talking about here is, is environmental concerns. Water pollution, air pollution, um, pollution's a nasty bugger. It, it doesn't stay put in the county. Once it gets in the water, it flows. It affects lots of things. So uh, certainly the, the, the concerns that are raised here with respect to this particular... Uh, animal feeding operation uh, present concerns uh, and, and risks to the environment uh, as set forth in the petition. And that's why it's at the core mission of Sierra Club uh, to advocate for its members in this case and why it ought to have a right to be heard. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, back in February of, of 2019, um, the Mocklers, uh, Travis and Jill, applied for a conditional use permit for an animal feeding operation. Um, member, the Sierra Club, through its members, uh, participated at the, uh, the first stage, the Planning Commission hearings, and voiced their objections and their concerns. The Planning Commission ultimately granted the permit, and Sierra Club appealed it. If Sierra Club was going to initiate an action in the county on behalf of the member or members, does it have to get those members' permission to do so? Or, or can it do it merely by the fact it has a member in the county? It, it would need... Uh, Sierra Club would need permission, uh, just like any other organization, according to its internal governance, in order to start an action. Um, there's a process for Sierra Club in this case. Um, there's a legal oversight committee that uh, authorizes particular actions. Um, the Sierra Club, and not some other entity, not Sierra Club, Inc., not individual members, Sierra Club appealed this matter from the Planning Commission to the next phase, which was supposed to be the Board of County Commissioners, but in fact was the Board of Adjustment. And it's that same entity, Sierra Club, that uh, 
presents the petition to this court. Um, that is pleaded uh, specifically in the petition. Those facts are deemed true. So facts to the contrary alleged uh, by the mocklers in their brief must be rejected uh, because they contradict the petition in this case. Um, ultimately, um, the Board of Adjustment, uh, which has a different process, different vote requirements, different burdens of proof, is the entity that heard the appeal. It was supposed to be the Board of County Commissioners based on the ordinances. Uh, so there's a violation of due process rights there. Also, as alleged in the petition, uh, the there was open hostility, uh, predisposition, bias, partiality, ex parte communications that Council, polluted. Um, I understand, you know, what your due process arguments are and, and the question before the court is standing. And uh, I'd like you to address um, uh, what, if any, authority do you rely upon to suggest that a due process violation alone, if established, would be sufficient to give Sierra Club standing first, you know, in its own right uh, before we get to the representational standing issue? This court recently in Abada versus Pennington County recognized that a due process violation itself is grounds for standing. And of course, wasn't a, a, um, applying, that was a declaratory judgment action with a different, um, a, um, a different standard for standing. It wasn't an aggrieved person standard that we have here, correct? Abada, uh, there's several grievances we have here. The, the first of which is the due process rights of Sierra Club itself. And Abada supports that as well as the um, Multistar Industries case from the Ninth Circuit. It says even if, even if ultimately there's no merit to the claim, parties are still entitled to due process. And in Armstrong versus Turner County, this court recognized that at the conditional use permit hearing before a board of adjustment, um, it's quasi-judicial in nature and parties are entitled to due process. But do that's they have not, to... Go ahead. You know, that, that's not really my question. I mean, I think there's no dispute as to whether due process is required. The issue is... Um, is that in and of itself sufficient to afford a party standing when you are dealing with the statute, um, the 11261 language that requires um, there to be a grieved party status? I believe. Personal uh, property or pecuniary interest at issue. Um, Your Honor, I believe that, um, I think about it does answer that question. It did, it did state that, that due process in a violation of due process, because that was the claim there, is that due process was not followed with respect to adoption of a zoning ordinance. And this court uh, reversed and found that ordinance to be invalid because of the due process violation. So that was the standing in that case. In addition to that Ninth Circuit case that I cited, uh, the multi-star industry says that the due process itself is enough uh, for standing to be aggrieved. Which was the next? Ninth Circuit case? That was a yeah. Ninth Circuit case. And that's that's under the heightened standard in federal court where you have the, the Article Three case and controversy. Uh, is, that's, it's a, a court of limited jurisdiction. So that's an even higher standard. Our courts are supposed to be open to everybody. Um, they're courts of general jurisdiction. Uh, ultimately, standing is controlled by statute. There's no question about that. And here, uh, 11261 controls standing. Uh, and it merely requires that a party be aggrieved. It, it doesn't um, have any particular type of grievance that it needs to be. And a due process violation is sufficient. It was good enough in Nevada. It ought to be here, too. Otherwise, if, the, if this court affirms the circuit court, what it's saying is um, Sierra Club uh, doesn't have due process rights that need to be respected. Uh, because we allege that there's a violation of those rights. And particularly, we allege uh, the types of things that disqualify the members of the board from making a vote that would violate due process that this court found sufficient in Armstrong versus Turner County. So why should Sierra Club be any different in terms of its entitlement to due process? It's an interest group like any anyone else. This would apply to the, the NRA, the ACLU, the American Bar Association, the AMA. Organizations are entitled to due process rights. They're entitled to be heard just like any other person. How does the fact that Abato was a declaratory judgment action, a different type of action, um, come into play here? I don't believe that it, it does matter. Uh, when we're talking about what, is, what does it mean to be agreed, there isn't any magic language in 11261 that makes it materially different than the Declaratory Judgment Act statute in that case. Uh, so you're basically saying when you have that 
uh, list of other organizations. Any organization uh, could be the Qantas Club, uh, Boy Scouts. Anybody would have the same ability as Sierra Club to, on behalf of its members, to initiate an action like this. They would. There would need to be a grievance involved. So sure. Um, and, and here we allege a grievance, which needs to be accepted as true. It's a facial attack, uh, as found by the circuit court, that wasn't appealed. Um, the general allegations are enough. Additionally, under this court's case law, any other specific facts that are needed to support that general allegation uh, need to be uh, read into the petition. So we've, we've alleged the due process violation here, which in and of itself is enough. I guess maybe it wasn't articulate enough. There's nothing unique to Sierra, Sierra Club compared to other organizations that treats it any different. All the other organizations would have the same uh, uh, rights. Yes, Your Honor. I, I think all persons, all organizations should have the same due process rights, regardless of their politics, regardless of their mission. Um, they need to have some grievance in order to be in court. Uh, we have alleged enough in the petition uh, for direct standing, uh, whether that be mandamus relief or whether it be a, re a certiorari under 11261. Could you address um, the your um, opposing counsel's argument that on the procedural question that you needed to produce more um, at this stage of the litigation than merely relying upon the general allegations in your petition. As I read their briefs, they were making an argument that um, at this point in the litigation, you should have produced affidavits or additional factual information. Um, and I understand, and, and I think relying upon um, federal circuit court cases that addressed an appeal of this nature in a little bit different manner than an original action in, in a district court or at a circuit court type uh, scenario. Well, I, I, I have two what I, what I hope are direct answers to the question. Um, you know, number one, the argument was waived. So the circuit court found this was a facial attack and not, not a factual attack where we would need to go and get depositions, affidavits. That was not noticed for review by the respondents in this case. That issue was waived. But secondarily, even if it's still before this court, um, the petition itself is verified. And a verified petition has the same effect as an affidavit as under oath testimony. And to the extent there is uh, deemed a factual attack, those facts need to be deemed true as well. Um, but what we have here is a motion to dismiss. This is merely at the pleading stage. This isn't summary judgment. It's, it's merely a motion to dismiss stage. And most recently, uh, in Huber versus Hanson County, this court found that mere allegations of uh, unmanageable manure and related odor was enough to be agreed. That's enough at the pleading stage to show that one has a grievance. Um, we have those specific concerns here, that there are uh, you know, manure issues and odor issues, plus a lot of other things. So we have more than what Huber and Hansen had, where this court found those allegations to be sufficient. Uh, so I think uh, because they're in the form of a verified petition, they have the weight, they have evidentiary weight. So it's not just uh, an attorney's pleading. Well, they are, they are a bit, uh, would you agree, your pleadings are a bit conclusory. Uh, you know, they say we have members who own land in the uh, proposed site, they own close by. In, in Huber, we had, a, I think, as I recall, the, the facts were they were right next door to the to where the uh, uh, facility was going to be built. We don't know location. So a little bit conclusory uh, in terms of if we're going to rely on those facts, if it's not a facial attack, don't you think there probably you need some more facts to, uh, if, if you get to that point, then there's a factual issue? Uh, I, I respectfully disagree. Um, I, I think we have some sufficient specific facts pleaded in terms of not just odor, but uh, a risk of pollution to the very water streams that our members use. They fish in it, they recreate in it. Um, that's specific enough. So you're saying you'd, you'd rely on these facts, nothing more, if it was a, if it was a factual attack on your standing? I, I don't think we need any more than what we have. Um, but, you know, again, most importantly, um, whether it's a factual attack has been waived by the respondents. So it's, it's their obligation to notice for review uh, anything they don't like about what happens at the circuit court level. They didn't, they didn't do that. 
and the circuit court was very specific that this is a facial attack. So if if we were to decide this as a facial attack and it goes back to circuit court and the the, um, the opponents continue to pursue a factual attack as to whether the allegations in the petition um, um, are actually true or not or allow you to proceed, then what happens? <clears throat> then, then what is required in your view? Well, uh, if, if they made a factual attack or, or, or even filed a, mo a motion for summary judgment, uh, for example, um, then we, again, I think we have enough. Um, put me on the spot now. Would I submit some affidavits or do discovery? I, I mean, maybe to beef up the record, but I, I don't think that's necessary uh, in order to withstand a factual attack, especially at the, at the pleading stage on a motion to dismiss. Um, if it got to a motion for summary judgment, perhaps more would be needed. Um, but again, we have evidence in the case. Um, it's, well, number one, it's uncontroverted evidence. There's nothing to the contrary. But more importantly, under a facial attack, all the pleadings are deemed to be true. When you say you have evidence in the case, what are you referring to? The verified petition, which is signed under oath and has the same effect as an affidavit. Is the dichotomy that we use in our case is between a factual attack and a facial attack uh, maybe in a case like this, um, sort of a misnomer, at least in terms of the facial attack. And, and let me see if you agree with this. And I don't know that I believe this myself. I want to see what you think about it. But just because we say there's a factual attack, or excuse me, a facial attack, that doesn't, it doesn't mean the court doesn't look at facts. It just means that the court doesn't undertake independent judicial fact finding. Would you agree with that? Facial attacks still require f facts. It's just a question of, of the die kind of being cast already rather than the court going ahead and undertaking judicial fact finding further. Well, certainly facts need to be pleaded. Um, facts in order to support standing um, need to be pleaded. Facts in order to support the substantive claim need to be pleaded. You know, right. if we failed to plead anything was illegal about the decision, they'd file a, a 12B5 motion and say it fails to state a claim. Um, so certainly at, at the facial challenge level uh, for motion to dismiss, there need to, you know, it, it doesn't, there's not any magic language. Um, it, it doesn't need to be overly specific. It doesn't need to be overly uh, formal. Uh, we don't need to use any magic words in terms of the relief sought. Uh, we can make general allegations that, as stated in Huber, um, the court then reads in whatever additional specific facts would naturally support those general allegations when you're looking at, at a motion to dismiss. The court reads them in how? I'm sorry? The court reads them in how? So if, if there's an allegation that, um, that there'll be runoff in, in the water pollution, if, if the court needs to read in, well, that, that must be a downhill slope then in order for the runoff to get there. Uh, so that... As long as the general allegation is made, uh, that the attack can't be that that's too generic, that that's conclusory. Could a court, uh, read, in, could a court read in uh, somehow on this petition an inference that there's individualized harm, for instance? Well, I, I don't need to, I don't think that would need to be read in because I, I think we've pleaded that specifically. Uh, but to the extent the court wants more meat on the bone, that's where that rule comes in to say, well, yeah, this is, this is close enough. Um, and, and particularly in, in, in Huber, um, the, the liberal construction of pleadings and notice pleading was particularly important because the petitioner there uh, asked for a writ of prohibition. Um, they, didn't, they didn't ask for a writ of certiorari, which is the remedy to reverse uh, the issuance of a conditional use permit. And this court found that not to be fatal to relief. That, Two minutes, Mr. Peterson. Uh, this court found that not to be fatal to relief. I do want to address one issue. The court ultimately found that uh, Sierra Club lacked representational standing, not because the members weren't aggrieved. The court in the hearing actually found the members um, were aggrieved, at least based on what was pleaded. But it's the third prong of Hunt where they said that uh, the court found that based on the claims asserted and the relief requested, individual participation as litigants was required on the part of Sierra Club members. I struggled to figure out why that would be the case. Um, evidence is routinely gathered from non-parties. A company can be a party. It often needs to get affidavits from employees in order to support a case. Third-party witnesses are often uh, deposed. 
Um, there's no basis, no reason to believe that individual members need to actually be named petitioners in this case uh, in order for the relief sought. The nature of the remedy sought is not individual or specific, and it doesn't vary from petitioner to petitioner. Most of the cases that have found uh, a requirement of individual participation has to do with when the remedy from member to member is different. Here we're requesting uh, essentially injunctive certiorari mandamus relief. It would be the same for all members. It would benefit all members equally. Um, there's no reason why Sierra Club members need to have their name on a petition in order for their rights to be vindicated, in order for their voice to be heard, and in order for Sierra Club's mission to be accomplished. Uh, we urge the court to uh, basically apply the law as it currently exists uh, and find that there is standing, both direct standing for mandamus and certiorari relief, and representational standing uh, on behalf of Sierra Club. Send this matter back to circuit court so its voice can be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, Mr. Donnell, you have 15 minutes, sir. Thank you, Chief Justice Gilbertson. May it please the court, counsel. I'm here on behalf of my clients, Jill and Travis Mockler, who are here today with their two daughters. They have a family farm. It's approximately 14 miles straight north of this university and a little bit west. They live in Pleasantville Township. They've had a family farm for a number of years. They sought to diversify their operation. They currently have a cattle feedlot, open lot. They'd like to have a new cattle barn, which would be a deep pack barn that has all of the manure contained within that barn. And in order to do that, they also want to diversify and get into a hog operation, also a confinement, which likewise confines all manure inside the barn. There's no question that these operations would conform with all state and federal regulations and would not pollute. These folks are very conscientious stewards of their land. They care deeply about the environment. We're not here today because we are opposed theoretically to better environmental conditions and preserving our world for our future generations. We're aligned with the Sierra Club in that regard. The problem here is that the Sierra Club cannot prove that they are a person aggrieved as required by SDCL 11-2-61. That's the standard that applies here. That is a legal term of art, persons aggrieved. As this court recognized, that goes back to the period before statehood, to a case back in 1875, decided by the Supreme Court for the territory of Dakota, decided just up the river in Yankton. And that case, Wood versus Bangs, was actually about a county. We had counties in the territory back then. Bonham County went to build a courthouse. There was a dispute, and certain electors brought a lawsuit about the construction and financing of that courthouse. The person aggrieved standard was necessary there to ensure that not all of the business of the county is subjected to litigation. And in fact, the, the Cable versus Union County case quotes parts of that case to talk about how it would be improper that we have some of these local decisions always being determined by the courts. Instead, certain things are to be decided by the county. These due process and other constitutional rights that are being argued here are not, in fact, justiciable. In other words, there's no case or controversy for this court to have jurisdiction over and to hear unless you've got one of these concrete injuries. They have to be- But we're a, we're a similar claim brought by a neighbor who is an individual. They would, would you dispute they'd have uh, standing to bring their claim? So you're talking about a situation like the Huber case, where you have a specific individual harm that they are claiming because of their proximity. And that's not pled in this particular case. Going back to that person aggrieved standard that applied back in 1875. Well, they do, they do plead that they, are, they have members that live near, I think the term is used is near, the uh, operation here, and then relate some of the same types of harms that Huber addressed. So could you um, address the, the procedural issue of is that enough this uh, stage of the proceedings, and does does that preclude you from further um, uh, mounting a factual attack as it progresses? 
Thank you, Justice Devaney. In regard to that particular issue, there was a remarkable admission made here today in the oral argument presented by the Sierra Club. They told you that they have to have at least one member who is aggrieved in this county. They told you there's a committee process and other things for them to be approved to go forward on behalf of the organization. And in order to do that, we need to know, as we argued in our brief in pages 13 through 15 and into 17, you have to identify the individual, at least one individual, who is the agreed person that your organization represents. And, and where is that from legal authority that says you have to identify an individual, or where, where do you derive that? We have cited to a case involving the Sierra Club itself, which is Sierra Club versus Morton, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1972. But, Your Honor, if I could be indulged by the court, pursuant to STCL 15-26A-73, there's a recent case from the Federal District Court in Boston that encapsulates this perfectly and cites to another case that is Summers versus Earth Island Institute, U.S. Is Supreme this court. case from Boston in your brief? It is not, Your Honor. It was only decided in August. Okay. Uh, then, under our rules, you need to provide, you used to have to provide 12 copies, I think, simply a letter, because we all have Westlaw or Lexis, and also a copy to counsel. We will do so, Your Honor. All right. I wasn't aware that this was going to be some such a specific issue, but it is a, a very specific issue uh, based on the admissions of counsel on Sierra Club's behalf. This was decided August 6th of 2020. It involves an organization called Equal Means Equal, and it's a case versus Fierio, who is the archivist for our federal government. Equal Means Equal is an organization that sought to ensure that the Equal Rights Amendment, having now been ratified by a sufficient number of states, is in fact enrolled as part of our U.S. Constitution. However, that organization was subject to a motion to dismiss the same standard applied here in this circuit court under Rule 12 in the federal court, which is our SDCL 15-6-12. And quoting this case, the court said, associational standing, however, requires that the, the organization, interior quote, at the very least, identify a member who has suffered the requisite harm, end quote. Draper versus Haley, 187 F3rd 1 at, at page 3 from the First Circuit, 2016, quoting Summers versus Earth Island Institute, 555 U.S. 488, from 2009. They go on to say, equal means equals failure to allege facts in this regard is alone fatal to its associational standing theory. Then they go on to quote other cases. Since opposing counsel has not had an opportunity to address this, I won't go further. There's also an Eighth Circuit case that says the same thing. If the court would indulge me again, I would provide a citation for that. That's a 2017 case, though. The bottom line is, we can't tell from the pleadings that they have here with the Sierra Club if one of the 194 members of their Clay County membership group happens to live close enough that we can assume that they are actually going to have some kind of concrete and particularized harm that's sufficient to be aggrieved in this situation. So since the circuit court actually relied on the third factor, I mean, before you run out of time, I'd like you to address that. Um, and um, how does... Um, the actual claims um, argued and the remedy sought, um, how do they require participation of the individual members if, if they are able to establish the aggrieved status? That's, that's exactly what goes to both the procedural due process or other constitutional claims and their claims in regard to the alleged damages that they suffer as members of the public who are affected by potential harm to the environment. They list the water, uh, their enjoyment of the area, and other general things. Those are all very general. But so the we need to requested here is not that type of relief. It's not a, a request for damages for individual members. It's to remand and send back to the to the uh, below to, for a proper hearing if the due process uh, alleged violations are found to have merit. Exactly. But in order to have that type of relief, you first have to prove that you are a person who can bring the case. And in other words, using the Armstrong case from Turner County, for example, there there was 
a building permit that was improperly issued for a construction of an expansion of the grain elevator near Vibrant. Individual members who live nearby contested that. It ended up in a situation in which one of the members of the Board of Adjustment, who was also a county commissioner, had some involvement directly with the people who were claiming to be damaged by the grain elevator. Those people then brought an action which resulted in a decision saying you can't have someone on the county commission acting on the Board of Adjustment because of the conflict of interest or potential bias. If we were to have a person from Parker, miles away, bring that same claim, they don't get to start that action. Their rights are not implicated in that regard. Therefore, you have to have an individual member pursue this in order to establish that they have the right to bring the claim. But that's, so that's a standing issue, and, and I fully understand why you would need an individual member to show that in order to give, you, uh, give them standing. But isn't the, the third prong, doesn't, really, doesn't that focus on something else? It focuses on the claim itself and the relief side. So how, how do the members, Sierra Club's members, why are they um, necessary with regard to those when you look at it with that focus? Aside from having to bring them in, perhaps um, affidavits, testimony to establish the standing for the appeal, how, how beyond that, what is required or why are the members necessary with respect to the due process claims in the request that it be remanded? Or, uh, back for further proceedings because they are required under the law to establish whether or not the due process or other claims actually happened so uh, if we have persons who are not involved as they claim in the decision-making process down below they don't have the right to bring that and I understand that's also a standing issue but when it comes to the relief that's being sought here send it back down well if they didn't have anything to do with it and they won't have anything to do with it in the future then it's speculative which doesn't get you to the point where you have this harm due process is due depending on the circumstances and the cases that look at that say you know the the individuals that need to be involved have to be involved so that we can establish their actual, for example, use and enjoyment of a national forest or the other things. Would ever be representational standing then, if if the participation that is needed is to establish their aggrieved status, then then what is the point or what scenario then would you ever have the ability or um, be able to apply or the case law that recognizes representational standing? The distinction being in those cases where you have to have the individuals because their issues are different from the organization. There's a potential for a conflict of interest, and I'm sorry, I should have gotten to this sooner. I didn't understand the issue. Right away, we look at 194 members in Clay County. Not all of them necessarily are against concentrated animal feeding operations, or in this case, this is actually just an animal feeding operation, lower density, different. Okay, different striations or different variations of animal feeding operations may not engage the same concerns in all members of the Sierra Club. You may have a conflict in that regard. Therefore, some, but not all, are necessary to be individual defendant plaintiff's parties in this case. They'd have to bring the petition. So individuals who have a different point of view than some other members should not be represented by the organization. And that's what just Judge Byrne wisely determined in this particular case. We have no information about who these people are or where they live. And it, therefore, we need to know what it is specifically that they are going to say is improper on behalf of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is the only petitioner here. So we have to have individual members in order to determine that they truly can do that represent, representational organizational standing in that particular regard. You know, and, and I think Mr. Peterson was arguing that requiring um, evidence or testimony is different than requiring participation as a party. What is your response? That's that? actually correct. And had they named an individual and provided that information, which he concedes is not necessary at the pleading state, that's not, the, that's not correct and that's not the law. Two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Had they done that, had they provided that information, they might have survived the motion to dismiss. They're not going to survive the motion for summary judgment that would follow that. But that's not this case. They didn't plead that. They're the captains of their domain when it comes to the plea. They control that. They didn't do it. It's improper for them to go forward in this particular instance because, as noted in the case that I quoted from, you have to identify at least one member. You have to identify them and identify your basis for being in court. 
They had the opportunity to do that. They could have brought in affidavits. They could have amended their pleas. They didn't do that. Instead, they chose to die on that hill. Unfortunately, that's a death they are un unable to avoid. With that, if there's, no, if there's no further questions, we would conclude. Thank you, Mr. Dano. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Simcoe, you have five minutes, sir. May it please the court and counsel. Um, my name is James Simcoe, and I represent the Clay County Board of Adjustment. Um, and uh, we join in the arguments, obviously, that uh, the mocklers are making here to a certain extent. We reserve time uh, for, for the board in case the, there were questions regarding uh, the application of 11255 and whether there was jurisdiction below, uh, whether there was person agreed below. Uh, and that, that doesn't appear to be an issue that the court is concerned with today, and I think that's correct. It's not properly before the court. Um, so there are two things that I would like to, to just respond to. One is I think, uh, Justice Devaney, you had it exactly right under Huber. Um, the methodology in that case separates out uh, when analyzing standing the due process violation from the grievance. And I think as you look at that case, um, they, <clears throat> excuse me, they analyze the four elements to bring a claim under 11261. The person must have standing, the petition must be verified, the petition uh, must set forth grounds of alleged illegality. <clears throat> and the alleged illegality in that case was due process violations. And then they uh, analyzed standing separately from that. <clears throat> that was the environmental issues. And in that case, Huber had standing because he was a neighboring property owner. In this case, we don't have that. <clears throat> Secondly, Mr. Peterson argued that there were, there's some, uh, in 11261, the fact that you can have plural persons indicates it's closer to a taxpayer standard. Uh, and I think that's incorrect. If you look at the legislative intent as um, expressed recently by the 2020 amendments to 11.2.1.1, um, uh, 1. they specifically codified cable as the person aggrieved standard to apply to chapter 11.2. So with that, we would uh, simply just join in the arguments and request that the um, decision of the circuit court be affirmed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Simcoe. Uh, Mr. Peterson, you have 10 minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, addressing, uh, certainly I'll go in any order the court would like to, but I'll kind of go through Mr. Uh, Donahue's arguments. Uh, regarding the party aggrieved status, due process rights are enough for standing. And I'll read directly from Abada, paragraph 12 and paragraph 13, just parts of it. Paragraph 12, thus to establish standing in a declaratory judgment action, the plaintiff must have personally suffered some actual or threatened injury as a result of the putatively illegal conduct of the defendants. Paragraph 13, here, citizens claim an actual or threatened injury resulting from a violation of their due process rights in passing a zoning ordinance affecting their property rights. A violation of due process rights is enough for standing in this, in this state. That is a grievance that is recognized in Abada. It's a grievance we have pleaded. Sierra Club has direct standing. Without even getting to the whole representational standing analysis, Sierra Club's due process rights were violated as alleged in the petition. The wrong entity heard this case using a burden of proof that was favorable to the mocklers, having a vote requirement that was favorable to the mocklers, and additionally, its members were disqualified due to predisposition, bias, and ex parte communications as alleged in the petition, which uh, must be assumed as true at the pleading stage. Secondarily, um, we have pleaded uh, harms to the individual members. Um, we don't need to say that someone lives next to this in paragraph 17 in the petition, which is verified as the weight of evidence. States petitioners members used to be affected water sources for recreation,
fishing, enjoyment, and other purposes, and they will be negatively impacted by leaching, pollution, and runoff from applicants' proposed CAFO in lands where manure from the applicants' CAFO will be applied. And additionally, in 18, we specifically allege petitioners' members live, work, recreate, and engage in other activities that will be adversely impacted by pollution from applicants' proposed CAFO. That's more than what Huber and Hansen found to be sufficient. That's enough in this case. Um, that, in order to find that the, the members are aggrieved. Um, regarding the alleged admission, in order for representational standing, Sierra Club needs a member that is aggrieved. In order for direct standing, it does not. Its due process rights are enough. Uh, so I wanted to clarify that as well. Um, ultimately, though, on the issue of representational standing, the question remains largely unanswered by the respondents. What is it um, that, that cheats them out of a fair opportunity to defend their case by not having individual Sierra Club members named in the petition? If they want to know where people live, send an interrogatory. We've got to answer it. The rules of civil procedure apply. They want to know information, they can request documents. They can take depositions. We can take depositions. We can get affidavits from individual members to support various things. Why is it they need to be named as petitioners? Why do they need to be litigants when they're not asking for individualized relief? They're not asking for relief that varies from member to member. They're asking for one form of relief here and that is for a fair hearing process for this to be, number one, reversed because there's no authority, but uh, alternatively remanded back for a fair hearing before the correct entity. That, the, the, the benefit inures to the members equally, and it doesn't vary from member to member. Uh, for that reason, there's, there's no reason to find that individual participation as a litigant is needed. There's no reason they need to be named petitioners. Um, ultimately, we simply want this to be heard on the merits. Um, this case has been going a year and a half now. Um, we just want the voices of our members to be heard. We want Sierra Club's voice to be heard. Uh, it's a due process rights vindicated and a decision on the merits. Uh, that's, that's all we're asking for. Is this a right to be heard? It's consistent with case law from this state. We don't even need to go beyond the state in order to find the basis. Um, with that, I would rest unless there are any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Uh, the court will be in recess until 11 o'clock.